had been shot and uh, he was coming in because we would want to do a program and nobody ever doubted that we should immediately uh, do a program. So we had to go around try to get as many people as we could. We t tried everybody, most people were out of town. Anyway, we finally managed to get three Americans, Carl Foreman, the film producer, a man called John Crosby, and an actor called Eli Wallace. Uh, we found that the BBC had grabbed Alec Douglas Hume and Harold Wilson, and uh, we had to make other arrangements, and we hauled George Brown, who was then deputy leader of the Labour Party, out of a party dinner. It was quite well into the evening by the time we got hold of him, and it was a bit later than that by the time he came into the studio at about half past ten. In the hospitality room, Bart Brown had obviously drunk too much. He was pretty drunk. When Wallace was introduced to Brown, Brown said, <clears throat> I'm a great admirer of yours. Oh, Wallace said, thank you very much. And then he said, uh, yes, I've always... And he kept talking to Wallace. Wallace was interested in talking to him. He went over and took a drink. Brown kept shouting at me. And he said, uh, have you ever been in a play by Ted Willis? And Wallace said, no, who's Ted Willis? Brown said, you don't know who Ted Willis is. Ted Willis was the author of Dixon and Doc Green, he said. You don't know who Ted Willis is? And, and Willis was a great labor supporter. No, I don't know. He said, that's the trouble with you actors. You're also very conceited. I was in and out between the green room and the studio. Uh, I wasn't aware that there'd been any great uh, hoo-ha of any sort. Uh, the, I thought the atmosphere in the green room was a bit strange, but I put that down to the fact that people were grief-stricken. Wallace listened to a time, and finally, he took his jacket off and said, I'm going to knock the cow off you. Get off that seat. Brown, without a surprise, sort of looked down and said, oh, shut up, shut up. He said, come on, get up. He leaped at it. I jumped in between the two of them to try and separate them. Here's the leader, deputy leader of the Labour Party and an actor of tussling on the night Kennedy was shot. About ten minutes later, Brown got on the program, was interviewed, the hysteria, the drink, and everything else, and he made a mess of the occasion. He was very much criticized, and his chances of becoming leader of the Labour Party were ended on that night. It was evening, late in the evening after the supper, and my father is sitting with his uh, papers which he brought from the office, and then it was next room, it was telephone call, and it was the foreign minister, Andrei Gramika, and he called it. It was some information that they received from the broadcasting, that was something happened in Dallas with President Kennedy, or he wounded, or somebody tried to shoot him, or, or he killed, or something. And my father was very, very nervous, not only because it was the President Kennedy, but because if it is something happened inside in, in the other country, this can mean everything, including the war. And so he asked him to call to the ambassador and to find what's really happened, or it is true or not. And so he did not come back to his papers. He was in the room, it was a telephone, it was small round table in the middle and he walk around there one minute, another minute, five minutes, it was no no call and then he pick up the telephone and told now it is the official confirmation from the White House that the president uh, died. Kennedy's press secretary was not at his side that day, but en route to Japan to organize a future presidential trip. We took off at six AM from Honolulu Airport for Tokyo. We were out about three hours when suddenly somebody grabbed me and took me into the lounge. Remember, this was a presidential plane. And there were sitting the six cabinet members, and suddenly I looked at their eyes. Something was really terrible. And they handed me a wire that had just come out saying, JFK has been shot. And they asked me to set up the telephone system to the White House. We had a very special system in that plane. The plane turned 180 degrees around, started back uh, towards Honolulu. I got through to the White House. It was total confusion. I couldn't really find out what was going on. And this went on and on and on until about a half hour later, suddenly I hear a shout in my ear, Wayside, stand by. Wayside was my code name. And then every 30 seconds for almost five minutes, Wayside, stand by, Wayside, stand by. 
And then Wayside, Lancer is dead. Lancer was the code name of JFK. I was crushed. I just, uh, I mean, for me, it was uh, the saddest moment of my life. Good evening. Well, as the whole world now knows, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, the 34th President of the United States, is dead. He was shot near At 11 o'clock, a Granada special for viewers in the north. It started off with, with Randy telling the audience all he could about what had happened, and he even was able to disclose the fact that Lee Harvey Oswald had been identified, and it wasn't known whether he had actually killed Kennedy, but certainly had been identified and was, and was subsequently arrested. When the press got to meet Oswald, the self-styled Liverpool Echo reporter John Peel was there. They brought Lee Harvey Oswald in, and I suppose he was about sort of five, six feet away from me. And, uh, either he didn't know what was going on, or he's a very good actor. I mean, he just looked kind of, come on, guys, you know, this has gone too far, you know. Is, is this a joke or what? And he had a big bruise on his cheek, I remember. And, uh, you know, he was standing, I was standing over there watching him, and Henry Wade said something like, you know, this is the man who's been charged with assassination of President Kennedy, and there was general excitement, and uh, then he was led away again. And... Uh, as I say, I've told this story so many times that I didn't really believe it myself. But then I was around at Andy Kershaw's a, few, a couple of years ago, and he'd got one of those TV documentaries about it, and uh, they were showing this film of the whole proceedings. I mean, they'd put the film on uh, to demonstrate the fact that Jack Ruby was in the room as well, mm -hmm. which I hadn't known until I'd seen this film. But in the last few frames, uh, there's me and my mate Bob standing there just watching, you know. So it was true, and uh, I was rather startled, to be honest, to see the truth of it demonstrated. We, the newspapers of the world, of course, are full of the news. We have a little film now uh, of the newspapers, and then Mike Scott will be showing you those that have come into the studio. We've already got tomorrow's newspapers. Judging by this film, so have a lot of other people. Uh, they all have the same sad tale to tell. Daily Express. Kennedy is dead. Car ambushed. Finally, um, I, by that time, had all the details in the newspapers and, and read to camera the various headlines um, from, from the newspapers. And my, my last moment was strange in a way because in some ways I looked as if I smiled. But when, when I looked at myself 30 years later, I realized that smile was a smile which was close to tears. Threw his arms around him and cried, oh no. I don't think there's anything more to say from tomorrow's papers. JFK was dead, and for one moment the news stopped the world. No leader had the same hold on us before or since. A politician had gone, yet it felt like a death in the family. The world had never felt that way before, because Kennedy occupied a unique place in our history. His was the first generation of world leaders with the power to destroy the planet, but whose promise to improve it was credible. And in the few short years of his presidency, JFK took us close to both extremes. Our hearts and minds went with him. In 61, Cuba's Marxist leader, Fidel Castro, had defeated an American-backed invasion, humiliating Kennedy. In 62, Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev, Cuba's backer, became convinced America would try again. Warships carrying missiles were dispatched. Superpower confronted superpower. Well, the atmosphere was little short of electric, because here were these ships coming across the Atlantic bearing missiles, and Kennedy had said that they come so far and no further and must turn around. And uh, Khrushchev had said they wouldn't, and Kennedy said they will, and the abyss was opening up before us. I mean, there was real fear in here, and people, I mean, really, really serious and intelligent people were having what they were convinced was their last thing. It was a farewell thing, and it was quite frightening. My feelings were mirrored exactly by the feelings I felt as a, as a little boy when I heard Mr. Chamberlain announce World War II. And I was six at the time, and I thought this meant that the door would open and the Nazis would march in and take us away. A real terror. And that's exactly how I felt when the, when the, the brink came. I'm living in Germany 
when Kennedy actually said to him, you know, if you don't stop or turn around by 12 o'clock, it's good night, God bless your brown bread. And I thought, God, God bless him. He's got, he's got Khrushchev. He, he, we're going to win this. And when he did, I was very proud of Kennedy. It was the Soviet leader who blinked. The ships turned back. Khrushchev's son, Sergei, believes the legacy of the crisis was a new understanding between the two leaders. During the Cuban Missile Crisis, my father, I think like a President Kennedy, he realized, I don't know, understood, maybe better to say he feels, that now they can, can find solution to the preventing the war, to save the world. Because both of them uh, found it during the crisis how to escape from the war, and they found the solution. When it passed, I think the relief was so enormous and we felt we had a man who could keep us safe and well for generations to come. Kennedy symbolized new hopes as well as unprecedented fears. The media image of the young Kennedy seemed to match the aspirations of early 60s Britain. The Tories had won an election on the slogan, you've never had it so good. Affluence, it seemed, was within everyone's reach not necessarily through the methods of the great train robbers, who in 63 made off with a then staggering haul of one million pounds. An attractive, charismatic American president was a mirror for British optimism. The chassis of that king of cars, the Rolls Royce, eight cylinder, six liter, all for a little under 9,000 pounds. Work hard and it could be yours too. There was a time of almost full employment, so there was more money, and those who had money, it did go further we could live more comfortably and more easily. And, and I say as a father with small children, I did feel that they had the prospects of a much better life ahead. And, and I saw the symbol of that hope in JFK. Then suddenly, on that November night, the news that seemed almost beyond belief, the symbol was gone. I was working at the London Palladium at the time, and I worked with the comedian Arthur Haynes, I was a straight man. I can just say I was devastated. You know, I had to pull my socks up and go on for the finale. And I just went through it automatically. Streets throughout the country were stunned by the news from Dallas. I was in the New Theatre Hotel, which was a pub near Granada Television, uh, and I was having a drink, and I remember very, very clearly, it was as if someone had turned off the sound effect marked northern pub atmos atmosphere. Suddenly there was no sound. And you went, what, what happened? And somebody said, Kennedy's been shot. Chris Stanford had joined Coronation Street as Walter Potts, a window cleaner in search of pop stardom. Oh, I'm not too little, not too much. He was a sort of, if you like, a mild send-up of what was happening in pop music at that time. So we had this strange phenomenon where we actually made the record in real life and it was released in the storyline as well. Uh, and the two records, the storyline record and the real record, went up the charts together. Hey, not too little, not too much, you've got a perfect love and touch. Not too little, not too much. And Walter's great moment. On stage with the new superheroes from after he lied to Parliament about his affair with call girl Christine Keeler. Society osteopath Stephen Ward was the link between the establishment and the oldest profession. And then there was this wonderful collection of tarts. You see, there was uh, Mandy Rice Davis, who was a very superb little preacher. And then Christine Keeler, who was a, a Mandy's colleague, but not of the same caliber. But she was very sexually attractive, and you couldn't deny that. Ward became the scapegoat of the establishment. He was put on trial, then committed suicide. Another twist to the story pursued avidly by the press and relished by the British public. The whole case obsessed this country. It indirectly, I think, led to the fall of the Macmillan government. I mean, it was very soon after that that uh, they had to pack it in. But the American public never read about the sex scandals in their own government. The president's wholesome, clean-cut media image was false. In many respects, his uh, private personality was very different from the public figure. He was a compulsive womanizer. They used to call him in Washington in those days, 
Jack the Zipper. If I, I can't say I was disillusioned when I heard about all that, about all his womanizing, but I was slightly surprised because it seemed to be so uh, enormous. I mean, you know, a, a whole collection of different women and at different times of the day and in his own bed in the White House and all over the place. I mean, he was a great bonker. He was one of the world's great bonkers. <laughs> I did, in fact, know that Kennedy was rather involved with women uh, and that there was a sort of sexual aspect of his career. And I often wondered to myself um, when this, how soon this would get out. Nobody ever spoke about it. Uh, it was quite interesting. I mean, I think quite a lot of the American correspondents didn't know about it. I mean, they may have had rumors, but nobody had anything concrete. And what they did have, they, it was at that time not considered proper to use of the head of state. Quite interesting. Couldn't do that now. Only one time when I was in this White House did a journalist come to me in my office, which was just down here. And he said to me, I'm getting information that JFK's got some mysticism. I gave him my 1960s answer. I couldn't get away with it in 1993. I said, listen, he's the president of the United States. He's got to work 15, 16 hours a day. He's got to take care of foreign policy and domestic policy. Now, if he's got time for mistresses after that, what the hell difference does it make? The guy laughed and walked out. That was the end of the story. I mean, I was a journalist after all this. I never, never considered for a moment making a public issue of this knowledge I had through private sources. I mean, um, journalists were gentlemen in those days. He was a man who made mistakes. He was a man who made serious and important successes. And that's how you look at a president. But I think the, the major thing that he did in his presidency was to save the world from nuclear war. And when the Cuban Missile Crisis, and now people understand how close we were to nuclear war and how President Kennedy solved that problem, I think that's something that is high on the list of legacy of President Kennedy. Kennedy was the Lock and Law, the Galahad. He was, uh, to most people who live now, don't realize the tremendous impact this good looking, youthful person. He'd only been president, I think, for two years or something of that kind. We were always surrounded by a very elderly statesman who seemed to be too old to be alive, let alone running country. But he was a man that even uh, us fellows who were younger than him could see was a sort of young buck with all the kind of power and confidence of the, the most important nation in the world. And uh, everything seemed to rest on his shoulders. And uh, we had tremendous hope for him. Kennedy, in some ways, was seen as a symbol, not just of a new America, but of a new world. He was a young man. He was good-looking, a sort of mixture of Robert Redford and Steve McQueen. And I think people felt when he took over that the world had a new chance. And America had the sort of leader which would enable it to lead us forward into a better future rather than simply keep things under control. Dennis Healy, a seasoned politician even then, was not immune to the widespread sense of loss. The thing I remember very well indeed was sitting uh, at home in Highgate in London and just hearing this terrible news on the radio and I burst into tears. I was horrified because I knew John F. Kennedy and thought very well of him. Uh, and it seemed to me, as it seemed to many people, uh, that a light had gone out in the world. As a political correspondent in America, Keith Kyle had got to know Kennedy before he became president. I was anxious to know what sort of impression he would make. Uh, and he asked me out to lunch and drove me into the countryside in his car. It was a most alarming journey. Because Kennedy engages one in conversation um, very intensely. He has an extraordinary ability to extract from you anything that you, anything that is worth knowing about a subject in a, in a relatively short compass of time. He makes a splendid television interviewer. Uh, and throughout this drive, he's looking at me full in the face, never once putting his eyes on the road, and he drove very fast. In 1960, when I first arrived in Dallas, or well, I'd been having there very long, uh, of course there was the, the election, and they had the uh, parades on consecutive days, and uh, that car came to a complete standstill, so I ran out and shook hands with him and said something like, good luck, Mr. Kennedy. And uh, he said, and it, it, it does sound so implausible, I'm almost embarrassed to tell you, because people think, oh, come on, you know, 
But he said something like, you're from England, aren't you? And I said, yes. And he said, well, you know, what are you doing here? And so I said, well, I just came over, you know, for a few months to learn about the cotton industry. So we had a bit of a chat. And of course, you don't really know. I didn't know whether it was like a couple of minutes or 30 seconds or whatever. Uh, for a politician, I thought this was probably unique. I mean, he, he, he talked about me rather than about himself, you know, because he would seem to be genuinely interested in what I was doing for a short period of time. So, uh, obviously, after that, I wanted him to win the election so I could say, well, that's my mate, John, <laughs> you know, he's the president of the United States. He's so fine. Lang, 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 lang. Kennedy brought glamour to the political stage a place where people were not accustomed to finding it. And television had not previously found, on either side of the Atlantic, so telegenic a politician. As Lime Grove crumbles, Sir Paul Fox, who once ran BBC Current Affairs here, recalled the presidential magic. He had a charmed relationship with the media. I mean, there's no question of that. The media adored him because he, he knew how to deal with them. He attracted the media, he attracted media people, and he was an impressive figure on, on television. I always remember he was over here on a visit to see Prime Minister Macmillan. Macmillan, after all, was a kinsman. He always called him Uncle Harold. I remember he was here, and it was the night of a panorama program. Um, and I asked Ludo Kennedy to go and interview him. And Ludo did a most marvelous doorstepping job on President Kennedy. I rushed towards him and I saw the Secret Service people. So I thought, I wondered if they were reaching for a gun or something because I just came out of the blue like that. It wouldn't have been possible that any previous president or presidents afterward could have been successfully doorstep. And what's more, President Kennedy recognized Ludo and said, oh, I've just read your book about Notting Hill Gate. Well, that was astonishing, you see. He didn't know I was coming. I mean, you can brief a president. You would say, oh, so-and-so is coming along. Ask him or say that you know about this. He didn't know I was coming at all. And that, that was, of course, very, very impressive. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. Remember that television at that time was not the powerful force it is today. But I did something after President Kennedy was elected that changed things uh, in the direction of television by convincing him that he should have live television press conference, something that had never happened with any president before. And then they called back. And, uh, there was a real charisma. He had a sense of humor. Uh, we now know that this image of him as being very young and fit is quite funny. He was actually extremely seriously ill in several ways. But he used to stand up and take questions at these press conferences. It was a performance. He was stylish. He was funny. <laughs> How is your aching back? <laughs> uh, it depends on the weather political and otherwise. The reporters who made the Kennedy reputation were also Harvard men and Yale men, and they got on like a house on fire with the Kennedy people, and they were very uncritical. To be fair, I think a lot of these people now realize that they were sort of, they were seduced and sort of had by the, by the uh, excitement and the charm of uh, the, the Kennedy coterie. But it, it, there was an enormous amount of uncritical journalism. There are many Americans who believe that in our manner of questioning or seeking your attention, uh, that we're subjecting you to some abuse or a lack of respect. Well, you're subject me to some abuse, but not to uh, any lack of respect, I don't think. Thank you, Mr. President. When the Black Watch played on the White House lawn on November the 13th, JFK had nine days to live. Well, it was a historic occasion for my regiment. I think the last time that we had been in the White House was when we burnt it down in 1812, as a matter of interest, or so my vice major told me. We thought it'd be a nice gesture on behalf of the regiment if we could make a presentation to the, uh, to the president. So... I made a very short speech in front of him before the performance of the band. And we gave him one of our regimental, big regimental um, dirks, uh, with the regimental motto inscribed on it, which in the circumstances, with hindsight, of course, is slightly ironic. I want to thank uh, Major for this presentation of the Dirk of the Black Watch. The Major just said that the motto of the Black Watch is 
nobody wounds us with impunity. I think that's a very good motto for some of the rest of us. Thank you. Fort Worth, Texas, on the last morning of Jack Kennedy's life. About him, as ever, the aura that made people talk of a new world Camelot. The charm and the wit. Two years ago, I said that, uh, introduced myself in Paris by saying that I was the man who had accompanied uh, Mrs. Kennedy to Paris. I'm getting that somewhat that same sensation uh, as I travel around uh, Texas. Nobody wonders what Lyndon and I wear. And so, to Dallas. And the shots that were to kill a president and stun the world. Washington on the night of November the 22nd, 1963. Finally, we arrived at the White House and we had a prayer session. And then Jackie said, why don't you spend the night here at the White House? This has been a tough day for you. I had never spent the night in the White House. So I went upstairs, and there was Larry O'Brien, Ken O'Donnell. We talked till about 5 o'clock in the morning. Finally, I went to sleep. And suddenly, at 7 o'clock, the phone next to me rings, and the secretary is saying, the president wants to talk to you. The first thing that comes into my brain, oh, my God, I've just had a terrible nightmare. And then I hear this voice saying, oh, Pierre, this is Lyndon. And I suddenly knew for sure that JFK was dead. At the United States Embassy in London on the morning of November the 23rd, a steady stream of visitors come to pay their respects. A stream that feeds a river of mourning worldwide. In the period immediately after President Kennedy's death, Mrs. Kennedy received over three million expressions of sympathy and condolence from people around the country and around the world. Uh, these were in the form of, uh, of letters, of spiritual bouquets and mass cards. And uh, those, a very substantial number, came from Britain, which was one of the countries which produced the largest spontaneous response to President Kennedy's death. Mrs. Kennedy received uh, approximately a half million letters from people in the United Kingdom. A lady from London wrote, uh, Dear Mrs. Kennedy, I hesitated writing at once, as of course you will be inundated with messages, and anyway, there are no words at all. I am still wondering if I shall wake up and find that it was a bad dream. It's so impossible to believe. Well, when I got a quiet moment, I thought I must write to that poor girl. Let her know that the whole world is looking. I'm watching to hear some at least small comfort for her. She had to have the love of every other. It was only that that was going to pull her through. You can have all the money in the world. They were a wealthy family. But you still need people. It's the feeling of others and the letting of you know that those people are there. Feeling for you, that's what brings you through these things. Dear Mrs. Kennedy, I am writing on behalf of the staff and pupils of St. Augustine's Secondary School on the tragic and untimely death of your husband, President J.F. Kennedy. We have followed with great excitement his fresh, youthful and wise approach. Your dear husband, Lee Floyd, would go down in history as the greatest man of our time. His steady toils for peace, his wonderful stand over Cuba, and above all, his civil rights bill. Indeed, we have lost a good friend. He will long be remembered with love and respect. Merseyside showed its respect in its own way. At Everton's ground, as at others on the day after Kennedy's death, a minute's silence before the game. I think a lot of people were so horrified by what had happened that they were glad to be able to take part in some form of tribute. And I was over there in the Bullens Road stand 
and uh, the siren started and it was almost, well it was actually, couldn't even hear the traffic outside. I've been watching Everton since I was about eight years of age. I remember that day when they had the minute silent, oh, a minute or two minutes silent. There wasn't sound, wasn't a sound anywhere. The bus was behind, couldn't hear a thing, you know, you know, it was just total silence. And next thing this bloke jumps up, punches the air, shouts, long live Khrushchev. Next minute, it seemed to go in, in slow motion, bloke hit him the back of the neck, and he seemed to go down in slow motion, you know, and they were punching him, punching him, pushing each other away to punch him, and then he seemed to make a, a pathway for the, the policeman to come along there, and the policeman, he just jumped over, and lift, lifted him up over that wall there, I don't know, it's just a funny thing, it's just one of those things where it sticks in your mind, it sticks in your mind. That was the way that was. That was the week that was. For many viewers, the unmissable weekend show. Irreverent, provocative, funny. Its producer knew that this edition called for something else. We were not doing a, a judgment on Kennedy. We were trying to reflect uh, what immediately was the national feeling, and indeed it turned out, though we couldn't know that at the time, the international feeling, that uh, a light had gone out. Uh, when a light has gone out, you don't... Uh, you don't do a, an investigative report on the quality of the fuel. A young man rode with his head held high under the Texas sun. Ned stood me almost in silhouette. There's, there's very little of me that shows because I did. If I start to cry, I don't want that on the screen because I don't think it looks right. Lord, he still goes riding on. I always remember seeing that little tear, uh, one tear coming down one side of the face, uh, uh, which. Um, I suppose symbolised uh, the, the shock that most people felt at the time. I thought it was, an, an, I'm very proud of that piece of music. I thought they did a wonderful job. And it, I was, I, I wish I didn't have to have sung it, but uh, it was wonderful to do it. At BOAC, some senior flight personnel were contacted urgently. I gave operations a ring, and I was told that I had to go out on the trip the following day. When I asked where to, they said, sorry, can't tell you. Well, where am I going? Sorry, can't tell you. Well, how long are you going away for? I can't tell you. Well, you try telling a wife that you're going away. You don't know where to and how long for. It's not an easy question, but she was a very understanding. The following day, I arrived at the airport and uh, I met the flight manager who then informed me of the circumstances. That we were to take the Duke of Edinburgh, the Prime Minister, Sir Alec Douglas Hume, plus certain high officials from the Foreign Office over to Washington for the funeral of President Kennedy. It could be described best as tense because having lost one of the world's great leaders, I think it affected everybody. And uh, obviously governments were uh, wondering what was going to happen in the light of the um, assassination. Royalty heads of state, many of them much older than the murdered president, and thousands of ordinary mourners converged on Washington. John Kennedy had had just over a thousand days to make his mark on history. He made the American people feel responsible for the disadvantaged, the poor, the blacks, the people who were regarded as problem people in the previous uh, system, but he made them feel that, that the American people were responsible for those who weren't full up as they were. There's the first bitter pangs of our incredulous grief begins to pass. We must thank God that we were privileged, however briefly, to have had this great man for our president. For he has now taken his place among the great 
figures of world history. Mrs. Kennedy asked me to send some typers up to, to play the quotation from the White House to the uh, cathedral. It had been just 12 days since the Black Watch played on the White House lawn. She knew that um, JFK had enjoyed the performance so much and the children that she would wish some recognition of that occasion um, at the funeral. Family life plays a big part in everybody's life at some stage. It has to. And their time was spent. I wonder how she felt inside. She must have been all torn apart. John F. Kennedy seemed young. He looked good. He did the right things. He seemed to say the right things. He had a beautiful looking wife. And I think that that's what the shock was. He was so young and he, you felt he was one of the gang, really. Then suddenly he was taken away. And I think that's what, but that's why I was in it, was in sort of shock. He was a, a young lad. Kennedy was so invincible, we thought, and the, the man who was going to defend the free world against all enemies. And there was a sort of air of optimism and, uh, and strength and confidence everywhere. And it was just a shattering thought. We thought anything terrible is now possible. <laughs> 